For decades, they've been the hottest thing around, not just in Christian fiction, but in general fiction. Authors Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins hit the mother load with their series Left Behind. The apocalyptic adventures of Buck Williams and Rayford Steele in Assassins debuted at number two on the New York Times bestseller list, which doesn't even include and count the Christian bookstores. Number five, Apollyon, came in at number one on the Amazon.com. Christian projects are invading even the secular world. Newsweek's religion writer Kenneth Woodward had a cover story called The Way the World Ends. The Y2K deadline was front page stuff back then, so people were percolating with great interest about millennial happenings, secret raptures, Armageddon. He pointed his readers to surveys which showed that a whopping 40% of Americans do believe that this old world is going to come to an end according to Revelation scenarios in some type of battle of Armageddon. Hal Lindsey's apocalyptic bestseller, The Late Great Planet Earth, he also pointed out, has sold something like 30, 40, maybe 50 million copies since it came out. Of course, skeptics and scholars alike are quick to counter that many, many of the predictions in Mr. Lindsay's book failed big time over the years. A great number of the doomsday predictions sincere Christian authors predict never come to fruition. In fact, listen to this. According to the research, many contemporary Christian theologians figure that all these things John the Revelator wrote about actually happened in some interpretation or other way back 2,000 years ago during the trials of the first century of the Christian church. John was not predicting a distant future. So what about us here? As we continue to study on the prophecies of Revelation, is this just religious fiction, particularly here in chapter 14, where we face a distinct challenge. In a way, it's kind of like the old children's game, Blind Man's Bluff. Does that ancient game ring a bell? You have a blindfold on, and now you've got to try to grope in the darkness for someone or something to hang on to. How can you know where your friends are? Or where all the bumps in the road might be the potholes, and the landmines. Could it be like that here too? The book of Revelation warns us with fearsome language about a spiritual organization called Babylon. But what is it? Who is it? Is it here now? Is it coming up later? If Babylon happened back in the first century A.D., then we can just maybe get on with life. It says here in chapter 14, in the message of the second angel, that Babylon is fallen. If that's the case, we don't want to be in Babylon. In fact, you can go over just four chapters to Revelation 18 and read a parallel warning there. Fallen, Fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. And then this, which is almost word for word what we've already read. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. So again we ask, but what is Babylon. This spiritual force isn't listed in the yellow pages under that name. I'm not making light of our dilemma. Millions of Christians are vitally interested in these symbols and their interpretations. Newsweek magazine, for its cover article, commissioned the Princeton Survey Research Associates to run a statistical survey and they found out that 19% of Americans in general and almost 50% of people who believe in Bible prophecy believe that the Antichrist, whatever or whoever that is, 
is living on this earth right now. Some even try to name him. Maybe he's walking around in your town or mine right now. Well, if so, that would be a good thing to know. So here's where we are. We're studying about Babylon, but what is it? The Bible warns about an antichrist power, but who is he or she? We're supposed to be careful that we don't get the mark of the beast in the forehead or in the hand, it says in Revelation 14, verse 9. But what is the mark? Mark codes? The World Wide Web? How can we avoid it if we don't know what it is? We should watch out for a beast power that has the mysterious number 666. All right, but what does that mean? You talk about blind man's bluff. <laughs> and the spiritual ante climbs even one step higher as we sense how these mysterious Bible symbols invade our own lives. If the book of Daniel describes four beasts and they represent four long defunct world empires, ancient Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, well, that's sterile and safe. But here in Revelation, the angel of God cries out in our direction, fear God and give glory to him. And then the third angel, don't worship the beast. Don't worship the image of this Babylon beast or you'll feel the wrath of God. Over in Revelation chapter 18 is a verse that comes right in my direction and in yours. After telling us that Babylon the great has fallen, fallen, we hear a great voice from heaven and it says this, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. And maybe as you fumble with the blindfold that's wrapped so tightly, blocking your vision, you wanna cry out, God, what are you talking about? What is Babylon? I can't come out if I don't know if I'm in. I can't come out if I don't know what to come out of. Well, let me share some good news, some words of encouragement as we keep on studying. Obviously, here at the end times, we think it is worthwhile to study these ancient Bible prophecies or we wouldn't expend these 20 devotionals out of our schedule on the subject. We believe these warnings and promises are valid for the 21st century, not just the first century, or we'd have moved on by now. We think Babylon is a last day entity, not just an ancient empire where Daniel and his three friends hung out. But I want to tell you something else, and it's this. We don't need to worry because the book of Revelation is a book offering us the revelation of Jesus Christ. Those are the first five words of this book. Did you know that? And what does that mean? Friend, it means this. No matter how these prophecies play themselves out, no matter how their fulfillments come to pass and in what generation those who have Jesus Christ as their friend and savior, well, they're in perfect safety. Friend, I believe that with all my heart. In the very thick of Revelation chapter 13, which is about as scary as you can get, with death decrees and 1260 years of persecution for God's people, it then says quietly and in verse 10, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Don't you like that? Patient endurance. Here in chapter 14, which is equally thunderous in its warnings, the same thing again. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Our friend Daniel, along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, lived back there in the first Babylon. It was a place of corruption. It was fallen. It promoted false worship. It tried to coerce 
worship and had its own death decree. But Daniel and his friends stayed close to God and they were all right. Here in the end time, with the return of Babylon, spiritual Babylon this time, we're going to see these same things. The Bible says clearly, these things were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Babylon will again want our worship. You can read that in Revelation chapter 13. It will be a fallen spiritual power. It will try to coerce worship, to demand religious obedience. Right down the line, Babylon number two will follow the lead of Babylon number one. But those who remain in the hand of God will be safe. Those who follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth, will someday stand on the sea of glass. And here's one more thing before we leave the beasts and the brimstone. God isn't going to calculate your salvation, your destiny, on the basis of prophetic correctness. Revelation isn't a puzzle where only the lucky few with the best slide rules are going to get into heaven. We get a picture sometimes of that hard, hard final question on Jeopardy with Alex Trebek. You're ahead of the other two panelists. It's final Jeopardy. Win or lose time. And now Alex Trebek leans in. Is that your final answer? Your life depends on guessing right, young man. Final answer? Listen. Friend, if you and I are saved in God's kingdom, it will be because Jesus died for us on the cross of Calvary because we accepted his death for us on the cross of Calvary. Not because we outsmarted Kenneth Woodward and Tim LaHaye and guessed right about Jeopardy or 666. It's all right to study 666 and the fallen kingdom of Babylon and the three angels' messages here in Revelation. We've still got a ways to go here in chapter 14. But all the way through, always, keep a marker back at John 316.